So it is the climate that determines the general form of the vegetation in any place on the earth. And sometimes the way things look is called their physiognomy. And that term is used too for what our faces look like or the face of a parrot or another organism, but it's also the general appearance of the landscape or the vegetation. For example, in the evergreen forest that we might find in the Pacific Northwest, there are many large trees through which the sun comes through in beautiful rays. Climate and weather are related, but one is more immediate and around us. The other is a more generalized idea. Climate refers to long-term weather, the combination of temperature and precipitation, and weather is the short-term conditions, what it might be like on any given day. So temperature is determined by a lot of physical phenomena, radiation from the sun causing light to hit different parts of the surface of the earth in different ways, sometimes impeded by water vapor in the form of clouds, and heat that goes into the surface of the earth is absorbed. It leaves by convection, can be reabsorbed by water and other gases in the air, etc., etc. And so water is also influenced, the water cycle is also influenced by heat and evaporation. So the climate on the surface of the earth or in a given spot on the earth changes during the course of a day and through the course of the year some places more than others. In the tropics, temperature and rainfall, wet forests especially can be more or less constant. In other places, rainfall is seasonal and in others, temperature is especially seasonal. So sometimes there are extra or superannual phenomena influenced by the cycle of sunspots. And of course, it's the seasons are determined as the Earth orbits around the Sun and the tilt of its axis causes certain parts to be further from the Sun and closer to the Sun at different times of the year. Over time, the Sun may get dimmer and of course there's the influence of gases in the atmosphere affecting things too, especially carbon dioxide. You probably know this already, but let's review what causes the greenhouse effect that is responsible for the continual gradual warming of the Earth's surface. Radiant energy from the sun comes through the atmosphere, heats up the Earth, and then is reflected but bounces back as it does heat inside a greenhouse, making it warmer and warmer. And what makes it bounce back, what acts like the glass in the greenhouse, is higher and higher in levels of carbon dioxide. This little diagram can show the reason for the seasons, because the Earth's axis is tilted if we look at the northern hemisphere, the sp in the spring, the tilt is coming closer to the earth. If we go here to the left, the summer in the north, it's pointed closest to the sun. In the autumn, it's tilting away again, and in the winter, farthest away. Places are warmer nearer to the equator because the sun hits more directly on the surface of the earth there. It's a little bit closer to the sun. The same amount of energy on a smaller surface area making much greater heat than if it's toward the poles. Astronomers have shown that the tilt of the axis is not constant over time, and in fact the Earth's orbit has changed a little over thousands of years. 
So the circulation patterns of the global atmosphere are influenced a lot by the Earth turning on its axis and also the phenomena of warm air rising, cold air descending. Warm air holds more water, has higher re relative humidity. As air cools, the water comes out of it, and that's why we have precipitation higher up, the air gets cooler. As we just saw, there's more heat coming in at the equator, and that causes warm air to rise, and then it goes up and eventually falls. And this is what we call Hadley cells. But they are also affected by the turning of the Earth, the Coriolis effect, and that's what causes ocean currents and air circulation patterns. As the Earth turns, things in the northern hemisphere are deflected toward the right, and in the southern hemisphere toward the left. You can think about this if you imagine you're a archer shooting an arrow from the North Pole toward the equator. But as the Earth turns, your arrow will be slightly deflected from its intended path. So if we look at a Hadley cell in cross-section, the Earth's surface at the bottom, near the equator it's warm and the ground is warming the air. The hot air is rising and expanding. The warm air goes toward the pole and then the cold air sinks and is heated and cool air is moving back toward the equator. So there are equatorial Hadley cells or, or tropical Hadley cells they're called, the feral cells in the temperate regions and then the polar Hadley cells and these are all in cross-section but you can envision them like tubular bands around the surface of the earth. But because the Earth is turning, the Coriolis effect makes trade winds in different directions and also ocean currents. Here is a diagram of the ocean currents that arise as the Earth turns from left to right. The currents are clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. There are lots of other interesting patterns that happen at a smaller scale. Rain shadows that take place, absence of moisture on the leeward side of a mountain as the air descends, sucking up moisture from the ground. And differences in temperature within a continent versus around the borders, the water um, keeping temperatures more regular, whereas inside a continent, even like within the peninsula of Florida, a much greater variation in temperature. So rainfall is not distributed equally over the surface of the earth. The driest places here are shown in white and yellow and moisture in greens, the wettest places of all, are dark black in tropical regions mostly. You can see as you go to higher elevations on the lower part of this picture is a cross section of the landscape from the west coast, the Pacific Ocean, to the Rocky Mountains. And at every place that it's higher elevation, for example, the Sierra Nevada rainfall precipitation is much higher as in the Wasatch Mountains and the Rocky Mountains. So here's a diagram explaining the rain shadow, which is an extra dry area, just as a sh light shadow is the absence of light, a rain shadow is the absence of moisture. As the water-laden air comes in from the ocean and climbs, the cooling air can't hold as much water so there's precipitation and luxuriant forests on that side of the mountain. As it comes over the peak and descends it warms and it can take up more moisture and so the rain shadow side is always much drier. 
In North America, certain air masses bring predictable, somewhat predictable climatic changes. The northerlies come from the Arctic in the winter, maritimes, tropical and polar. And then there are things that happen every 8 to 10 to 12 years, which are global oscillations. We're in the middle of an El Nino right now, an ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation. But there are other ones that happen too, Arctic Oscillations, North Atlantic, and Pacific Decadal Oscillation every 10 years or so. So these two diagrams will show the difference in rainfall patterns in normal years versus El Nino years. In a normal year, trade winds and oceanic currents combined to cause rising air to be full of moisture, which then precipitates and currents go into the upper atmosphere, air falls, picking up moisture as it warms, making those areas dry. But during an El Nino year, things are turned around. The Ocean currents are weak, no upwelling, not changing the temperature of the water. Water is much warmer. And rising air will come off that warm water, causing more rainfall there. So areas normally dry become very wet. And areas that normally have rainfall, the air currents descend there, picking up water, and they dry out. So in this figure, we see the El Nino index, the ENSO index, standardized based on ocean and air temperatures as well as um, those, the effects those have on precipitation. Following an El Nino, there's a return to normal, in fact more than normal, and that period is called the La Nina. And you can see El Nino events happen sometimes 10 years or so apart, sometimes less, sometimes more. So we started off mentioning physiognomy, the general structure of the vegetation. It's what things look like, and you may have very similar looking vegetation in really different parts of the world, made up of very different species. All over the world we can find places that are with big tall trees, forests, other parts dry with few succulent plants. The drivers of this look or appearance of the vegetation are rainfall, temperature, seasonality, and whether or not things freeze or not. So here's a depiction of the globe showing areas that never freeze in yellow those that sometimes have frost, the green areas, you can see Florida's included there. Darker areas with frost and white areas with fewer than three months frost free. Here's a nice little diagram showing that if plants if there's enough precipitation, especially in the winter in certain places, you, there's a high probability of getting trees. And if lo there's low precipitation, a lot more succulent plants and a predominance of shrubs. So I'd like you to think about several reasons a region may be arid. And different places on earth where you think the aridity is caused by, by that particular reason.